going to be on the screen, but if you have a Bible, it's Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Picking up at verse 17. Hear the word. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they, are, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that, that you speak. We thank you that your word is true, and that we can trust it. May we hear it. May we listen to it. May we live it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The last two weeks, I, I began the message the same way. I began um, with lines saying, I can do it myself. And I said, those are words that we start saying when we're quite young. I can do it myself. And even if we don't say those words, um, we kind of indicate those words by what we do. I can do it myself. And that's not all bad because we want children to learn to do things by themselves. We don't want them to be dependent on mom or dad for absolutely everything that they do. There's a, a level of independence that you have to learn to make it through life. So it's good to learn things and to mature and to be able to, to do things yourself. But you have to be careful with that, we said. You have to be careful with that because, yeah, we are better together. It's better to be able to do things with one another and to interact and make things happen that way. And to take that attitude, I can do it myself through life, that can be a very negative thing. I can do it myself. I don't need anybody's help. And it's especially bad when it's I can do it myself religion. I don't need anything. And I'm just going to do it myself. In fact, when it comes to religion, I'm going to prove myself to God. I can do it myself. There's a lot of I can do it myself religion in the world. That was one thing that we talked about then, that I can't do everything myself. But it's one of those things you hear from early age, I can do it. Here's another one. Here's another thing that we, we hear when we're pretty young. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I can remember hearing those words. I can't, I can't remember saying them, but I remember thinking them. Are we there yet? Now, I know that we have a whole lot of gadgets, and I know that traveling's a little bit different than it used to be, because now when you travel, you can pull out your gadgets, and you can be on your phone, and you can do all sorts of things and be entertained in a way that you couldn't uh, years ago. But nevertheless, sometimes we still find ourselves asking that question, are we there yet? Are we there yet? But it's not just uh, when you travel. Think of it. Uh, imagine someone, in, someone opening up a business. She's opened up this business, began this new business, and she's been in business for about three years. And you say, oh, well, how are you doing? How's the business going? And she says, well, it's going pretty well, but we're not there yet. We're not where we want to be. We haven't arrived there yet. And you can think of different things where, where you say that. Well, we're not there yet. And that's true of us as believers as well, as followers of Jesus Christ. There are times in our lives when we say, you know what? I am not there yet. I'm not where God wants me to be yet. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul himself, who grew to be this very mature Christian, had to admit 
I haven't obtained all this. I, I, I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived yet. But nevertheless, he said, I keep pressing on. And he also said that I do not lose hope, but I keep at it. I keep at it. And in this passage that we read this morning, I think that's what he's saying to us. You haven't arrived yet. And he tells us two things, two things that we have to do and two things that we have to keep on doing. This is not do it once and then you've arrived. No, these are things that you do and you keep doing and you keep doing and you keep doing. But before we get to those two things that we are to do, I believe in verses 17, 18, and 19, those verses, he tells us why we need to be doing those things. Okay? So let's look at that first. We're, we're going to look at two things we need to do, but before we get to those two things, why do you need to do these things? Look at verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. The Apostle Paul says, I'm telling you something, but I'm not just telling you, I'm insisting on it. When you insist on something, you're not hinting at something. You, you are not... Um, you're not just stating something. You are saying it emphatically. My dad said to be home by 11. Uh, do you think he really means it? Yeah, he meant it. He was emphatic. He was insisting on it. Be home by 11. Okay. That's kind of what the Apostle Paul sounds like here. He says, I'm insisting on this. I'm not hinting at it. I'm not giving you a suggestion. This is, this is what I'm insisting on. And what is it that he's insisting on? He says this. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. You are Christians. You are believers in Jesus. You are Christ followers. And I insist that as followers of Jesus Christ, those who believe in him, those who are seeking to follow him, that you don't live the way everybody else lives. I insist on that. I insist on that. You are different. And you are called to be different from the rest of the world. I think sometimes we forget that. We forget it in two ways. One of the ways that we forget it is we, we just start living like everybody else and it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, just do what everybody else is doing. Sometimes we, we forget it that way. But I, thought, I think also we forget about it in the church in this way. We, we, we become very angry when, when, when the world goes in a different direction than we think is right. You can be talking about politics, you can be talking about education, you can be talking about entertainment. And we say, oh, you see the stuff that Hollywood puts out? How they're degrading the family and stuff? What do you expect? They're Hollywood. You get what I mean? They don't know Christ. They're not believers. No wonder they do what they do. And if we think that, quote, quote, the world is going to act like Christians, think like Christians, we're badly mistaken. They're not. Now, don't get me wrong. There's certainly some Christians in Hollywood. There's certainly some Christians in Washington. There's certainly some Christians in Lansing. There's certainly Christians in, in higher education, in public universities, and all the rest. But if we think that the world as a whole that doesn't believe in Jesus is going to think like people who believe, we're badly mistaken. Didn't the Apostle John, 1 John, say, don't be surprised if the world hates you because you're a follower of Jesus. We need to remember that in this world in which we live. We need to remember that, that we are different and think differently than the world apart from Christ does. Here's their problem, Paul says. 
I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. And here's the problem. Due to the hardening of their hearts. What is their problem? The Apostle Paul sums it up this way. The world apart from Jesus has a hard heart. They don't get it. They don't understand it. They don't believe it. There's no way they can get and understand you or the truth because they're hardened against it. But we have to be careful here. Something, wow, surprising happens. If your Bibles are out, I'm turning back in the Bible to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8. And in Mark chapter 8, something fascinating happens. Uh, I'm just going to read it. During those days, another large crowd gathered, and since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on these people. They have already been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way, because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Well, how many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Yeah, seven, they replied. And he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. And when he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And they did so. They had a few small fish as well, and he gave thanks for them also, and he told the disciples to, to distribute them. And the people ate and were satisfied. And afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. And after he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Delmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him, and they asked him for a sign from heaven. And he sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got into the boat, and crossed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And they discussed it with each other, and they said, it is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Jesus asked that to his very own disciples. Are your hearts hardened? And something fascinating, you go back to chapter 6, chapter 6 of, of, of Mark at verse 52, they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves there Hearts were hardened. The scripture says that about Jesus' very own disciples. Their eyes were closed, their hearts were hard against the truth of God. They didn't get it. Even they had hard hearts. And so it's a warning, isn't it? Be careful. Be careful. Even to, to those who are close to Jesus, be careful. Be careful that you do not have a hard heart. Yeah, you can talk about the people out there. You can talk about those who are far away from God, but be careful. It's a problem that can hit even Jesus' very own disciples. It can be people like you and people like, like me. We can have hard hearts. Now, when the Apostle Paul talks about these people, he says, I don't want you to be like them. And the reason I don't want you to be like them is because they have hard hearts. They're hardened against God's truth. They don't get it. They don't understand. Don't expect that they will. But the reason he tells us that isn't so much so, so that he can point his finger at them and say, look how bad they are. Look at what they're doing. Look at what he's doing. Look at what she's doing. He's not doing that. But what he's doing is saying, look, that's not who you are. That is not who you are. 
Yeah, you can see all this stuff going on. They have hard hearts and that hard heart heartedness leads to bad behavior. That's not who you are. Mm -mm. And that's why I insist that you don't live like everybody else is living. That you don't think the way that everybody else is thinking. Don't you realize who you are? And so he's not pointing the finger, but he's looking at people like you and me, and he's saying, realize who you are in Christ. And I insist that you live differently. And he tells us two things to do. Not to do one time. This is not like the basketball tournament where if you lose, it's one and done. This is something that you do over and over and over again. This is something to do and to keep on doing. Don't stop. And so what does he say? Verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Put off your old self. You've got one of those. And so do I. We have an old self that knows how to be angry, to be selfish, to be proud, to be lustful. We have one of those old selves, or put it this way, a sinful self. We've got one. Might not want to have it, but we've got one. And it sticks with us. And the apostle says, now put it off. You're a believer in Jesus Christ, so I want you to put off that old self. You know how to be that way. You know how to be like everyone else. That's not who you are in Jesus. So put that off. For you see, that old self is taking you in the wrong direction and it's taking you farther and farther away from God. So take off that old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Now, he could have said here, by its evil desires or its selfish desires. But instead, he says that that old self is being misled by deceitful desires. I, I, I heard about this um, um, auto repair shop. It was on a, this is years ago, it was on a very busy road. And auto repair shop, uh, back in the day before you had your cell phone, before your car talked to you and told you how to get to wherever you're going, you know, b before those days, you'd stop and ask for directions. <laughs> what guys would stop and ask for directions? But I mean, it used to be, you know, you had to stop and ask for directions. Anyway, this is a car repair shop all the time. You know, car repair guys, they know where everything is. And so people stopped constantly at this car repair shop and they didn't want to do business there. They just wanted to find out where they're trying to go. And the guys there kind of got tired of it after a while. So they just started to make stuff up. Started to lie. That's what they did. So someone pulls in. Oh, yeah, I know where to go. Go down two blocks, turn right, go down three blocks, turn left, go a few blocks farther. It'll be right there. They just make stuff up. And the people ended up farther away from where they began. Just make it up. That's kind of Paul's idea here, deceitful desires. Yeah, you can talk about evil desires, but, but, our, but our desires, lots of times, they deceive us. They trick us. And they send us in the wrong direction. And so the apostle says, put off that old self. You've got one. Wants to stick to you like glue. But put it off. And keep putting it off. It's not easy, but, but, but do that. And instead, put on the new self. That's what he goes on to say. Put off the old and put on the new. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put 
on the new self created to be like God. Put this on. Um, I'm glad that people want to improve themselves. You know, sometimes people realize they have a problem and they want to improve themselves, and so they work at it to, to improve themselves. Go to Barnes & Noble, for example. You can go there and look at all different kinds of books, but you'll see a pretty healthy-sized section called self-improvement. And, and I'm glad that people want to get better at things, and so they're working to improve their lives, and I'm happy about that. Self-improvement, you think it's good to want to improve. But this whole idea of self-improvement, that's a pretty feeble thing. I can make myself better a little bit, but self-improvement isn't where it's at. We need help with this. And when the Apostle Paul says, take off the old, put on the new, he's not saying that you've got to pull this off by yourself, but what he's saying is cooperate with the Spirit of God who is dwelling in you. Let God work in your life and let him strengthen you so that you can take off the old and put on the new. Sometimes, sometimes, um, yeah, whatever. Pe people are getting in trouble and stuff. Things aren't going real well in their lives. And, and so we say to the person, you need new friends. You know what I mean? Sometimes you, you need new friends. The people that you're hanging out with and stuff, th this isn't really good. You need new friends. And sometimes that's true. Some, sometimes people need new people around them to help keep them going the right way. Sometimes we, we picture something like this. You picture two voices. Maybe, maybe you even picture like, here's a good angel on one shoulder and a bad angel on the other. And, like, and, the, and these angels are whispering to you, do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. And, you, and they're outside of you and they're, they're, they're close and they're whispering in your ears. This is deeper than that. What the scriptures teach us is that Christ lives in us. If you're a believer, it's not just the pressure from the outside, and it's not just voices nearby, but Christ is in you. And listen to that voice of Jesus. You can't do this by yourself. You'll always trip, you'll always fall. But instead, cooperate. Cooperate with the Spirit of God. Let the Spirit of God speak to you and follow that Spirit. And by the grace of God, by the power of the Spirit, then keep taking off the old, listening to the Spirit and putting on the new. It's not easy, it's not simple, but you don't do it by yourself. And you surrender to the Spirit and the Spirit works in us, enabling us to do that. And it's not a one and it's over. It's a constant thing. John Calvin used to talk about daily conversion or repentance, that we keep doing this. We keep coming back to this. I know that I have that old nature and I know that that old nature rises up, wants me to do all kinds of selfish and arrogant and lustful things. I know that spirit's out there. I know that it's in me. I can point out there and say, hey, look at all the bad in the world, but I know that it's close to me. It's in me. And I know that I can't do it myself. And I know that I'm not there yet. But if I keep daily surrendering to the spirit and praying that God will help me take off the old and put on the new. Then we won't be living like everybody else, but we'll be honoring and glorifying our God by what we say and what we do. May Jesus dwell in us richly and empower us to take off the old to put on the new. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. But keep pursuing that which God has called you to do and to be. Let's pray together.
Father in heaven, we thank you for the spirit of Jesus that dwells in all of us who believe. Some of us try to do better. Some of us want to be better. Some of us don't try very hard at all. But Lord, may your spirit work in us. Keep drawing us closer to you. Enable us through your strength to take off that that old, selfish, sinful self and keep putting on the new self so that we indeed look more and more like Jesus, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.